Our keynote this morning, I'm very excited, from Dr. Phyllis Schneck. Uh, lots of wonderful information about her background in your program. I want to highlight just a few things. Uh, the, she is the Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity and Communications for the National Protection and Programs Director. Uh, previously, the Chief Technology Officer from McAfee for Global Public Sector. She's been named one of the Information Security Magazine's Top 25 Women Leaders in Information Security. For eight years, she was the Chairman of the National Board of Directors of FBI InfraGuard, and she also has a PhD in Computer Science from Georgia Tech. Uh, I certainly didn't do her justice with all of that. Please take a look at her full information in the program. But we're super excited to have her this morning to talk to us about security, about her perspectives, uh, and, and where she sees us all going as we work together. Uh, please welcome me in, in introducing Dr. Phil Schneck. works and walk around a bit. Everybody awake? Yes. Can I get a loud and good morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I know that uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to get to be on this coast. It's sunny. There's science. People don't speak in acronyms. I'm really enjoying this. I feel like I'm in a room full of uh, great smart people. So what I want to do is talk for a little bit about what we're doing at the Department of Homeland Security. Some of the feedback we've gotten on our other trips out here is that many folks don't know what the department does, especially in cybersecurity. Uh, humor me, how many people know a little bit about what the Department of Homeland Security does in cybersecurity? Okay, so that's good. Um, I'm going to embarrass one of the smartest people I know out here. I'm going to point you out to uh, Dara McElroy, who is your cybersecurity advisor. He's your federal Department of Homeland Security cyber representative extraordinaire for this part of the country, so we'll embarrass Darren a little more later. Um, really want to talk a little bit about what we do, a little bit how we see cybersecurity, a lot about uh, how we want to work more with you. Industry, academia, uh, my role, I have charge of the, the defensive cybersecurity mission for civilian government uh, and private sector. And I say private sector because if I say industry or dot com, it doesn't include our state and local, and it doesn't include our universities, and those are very big parts of this. Our research, our open source, our application developers, our people that discover the next big things and put it out there for everybody are the most important resource we have as a community, as a country, to use the internet, to enjoy the internet, and to protect all the communications that we have, and that's our job. Cybersecurity, according to our secretary, Secretary Johnson, I'm going to try to walk around a little bit, is part of Homeland Security. And for us, that means how do we keep people able to enjoy this great connectivity. You all saw the news all summer, it's depressing. But we want to be able to take that connectivity that's being built and make sure that it can grow as you grow it and that we can continue to enjoy it and that the next generations to come are told enjoy it and it's part of their culture on how to protect it. We never ever want to be able to say pull the plug, don't use that, don't do that, it's dangerous. We want to be able to say we're going to make it safe, we're going to make it better and we're going to keep innovating. So in that spirit, there are two things that are most important to me. Uh, trust. So I'm a science geek. I come out of the high-performance computing world for cryptography. My most important priority is trust with other human beings. Building that trust with our area. So I have charge over 2,000 of the smartest people on the planet in cybersecurity. From incident response to developers, to people that build partnerships, to people that work with other countries on the international front, to people that work in policy, and people that work across the department in spreading our cybersecurity mission, people that work across the government, people like Dan. But we want to make sure that we enable them, that we're working directly with you in the private sector to get the best of the best, and that starts, and I'll talk a lot about this today, uh, with building trust. And part of that comes with partnership. So my favorite story about partnership uh, comes from when I was the national chair of a volunteer organization called InfraGuard. How many people have heard about this? There's a strong chapter out here. So. How many people are in it for guard? Thank you very much for your work. I know that's not your day job either, but that's an important piece of partnership. I briefed about 80 FBI agents back in 2004, and we all came back on the same flight because it all connected through Atlanta. And the gate agent looked at the papers, there were still papers back then, for all the agents and things they might have been carrying, and they did agent after agent, and then she got to me. 
And she looked at me and she looked at the agent, this is a true story, the agent right in front of me and said, sir, will you be transporting that prisoner all the way to Atlanta? <laughs> <laughs> because it was unheard of that there would be that much federal agent presence and somebody with them that wasn't in trouble. So we're trying to change that view of partnership. I think we've gotten a little bit uh, better at it as we build these organizations, but this is a good example of partnership. And what I would like to help do, and I need your help, we all need your help, is bring science back to government, bring science back to Washington, help us put innovation at the forefront. The director in which I sit, I am a, a first and foremost a deputy to a very visionary undersecretary, Suzanne Spaulding. Um, when she asked me to take this job, one of the things that enticed me was her vision of taking what that which is known as infrastructure protection, so protecting those lights, the gas, the oil, the water, the emergency services, your food, all the things that make our way of life and how cyber runs between them. And she's taking our entire directorate and making it an operational focus and saying when something breaks, we, our field forces, will understand how to respond to it, how to keep it running. We'll work side by side with law enforcement and other parts of government but it doesn't necessarily matter if it's cyber or if it's not. And bringing that together, bringing all of our cyber and infrastructure resources to bear in each event. So we start to look at our way of life as interconnected. Uh, so first and foremost, I tried very hard to be a good deputy. And that means helping as we reorganize ourselves into that focus and helping to enable our partners to help us with that and get feedback from our partners and our workforce on how to get it right. The other part is having charge over cybersecurity communications, and that's the part that does the protection of all of our civilian agencies and our industry. And I'll talk a little bit about our programs and how we do that. We do it with people, and we do it with machines. So infiltrating the computer ecosystem with an understanding. And what I tell people, and uh, what I've told people actually on the Hill, and less technical crowds, is if you think about this quote you hear a lot called the Internet of Things, Everything's got a processor, everything has some logic. It's our job to make sure that that computer, which by the way is not smart, it's only fast, executes instructions, only those instructions that won't hurt it. And all they do is fetch instructions off of memory. And the bad guys know this, and they fetch it fast. So we have to make sure that if they go to execute an instruction, they already have an indicator or received a hint somehow that it's bad. So how do we take what we know and infiltrate that ecosystem? And that, a lot of that, again, goes from people talking to people and building trust so that we can connect our machines, so that we can get the language and the knowledge to do that. And the other side is when we protect the private sector, doing it slightly differently, and I'll explain that in a moment, but understanding how we push data out to the private sector and work very closely, and this is important, with our privacy and civil liberties experts. That's what makes us special at DHS. We have the only statutory privacy officer in the US government. And that means that at a time when, and I know, because I came from one before I was in this job, as a large company, it's very hard to do global business if you're perceived as being sort of tight with the US government. I get that, we get that. At the same time, there's never been a more urgent need to collect information together. So we have to do that right, observing all the privacy and civil liberties rules. And we're working on doing that as if that's not hard enough, doing it in real time so machines can talk to machines. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit of how we do that, um, how our programs look, uh, but most importantly, get you to help us and think about how to help us uh, take government forward. We want to make sure that we are, and I really did say this, a customer service organization, that the resources that we bring to bear are yours, that you know that you can reach out to us, whether you want to share something or get something, and that we're responsive. And I'll walk through our programs and how we do that and make sure that you know we are doing everything we can to be the government of tomorrow, not the government of 20 years ago. And I'll start out by saying one of the reasons uh, that we're out here longer than just today is we've been looking at, you heard our secretary announce last April that we're opening a West Coast office, a Silicon Valley office. So that is looking at how we not just set up a nice little office in prettier weather, and a lot of people are interested in that by the way, but it's more about how do we be part of the community? How do we support Darren's work? in engaging trusted relationships so we can bring you some of what we know and understand how we can actually bring in some of what you want to do. And a little bit of humor, when I got to government, I learned that it's really hard to take a meeting without a lot of lawyers. So that made it, for me, really hard to see a lot of technology that's out there. And I heard from former colleagues and new colleagues in the private sector that it was really hard for them to come show us anything. So we worked with our lawyers. They really did get to yes on this one. They're great. 
And we have a process where we can take a quote sales meeting. And it answers the mail from any companies that want to say they tried to sell something. I get that. You have to. But it also helps us see the new technology that's coming. And they bring the technical people. So we are open to this. We want to see the innovation that's out here. It's important. And we want to build on that. So well, let's talk a little bit about how we protect the federal civilian government. Um, I will start by saying that it's very difficult right now to outline uh, where our roles and responsibilities are. So right now, we protect the federal agencies with a program called Einstein. How many people have heard about this? So I got a little bit technical, but and I'm happy to take more in Q&A. This thing is intrusion detection. And a little bit of humor when I first got here, and, uh, people sat me down and said that system's 10 years old and they waited for me to get very defensive and so I did. I sat up and did the whole defensive thing and I said it's not 10 years old and they waited and waited and I said it's 25 years old. Right? We all know intrusion detection is pretty much, uh, that was around a while. But why do we have this? We have it because first and foremost it's a good fence. It's intrusion detection and prevention for all our cabinet agencies. Uh, but I look at it as a platform. We are seeing, and we're allowed to do this, our privacy guys let us do this, we're seeing all the traffic that comes in and out of the federal agencies, okay, U.S. government only. But we're seeing that. So it helps us to understand, and we know this from an analytics perspective, what's good, what's bad, what's anomalous, and we can form indicators with that. So cyber threat indicators of things we wouldn't see without that situational awareness, without that picture. This also helped us find uh, different parts of, you recall, of course, the bad news this summer with the Office of Personnel Management, that system helped us find another location that was affected that we wouldn't have known. What we did was we looked at the behavior that was happening at OPM and we said, has this happened? Anyone have a TiVo about 15 years ago? Rewind. Has this behavior happened in the past X amount of time anywhere else? And that's how we found another location. And we were able to block that up as well. So when you think about that system, it's not just intrusion and prevention. It's uh, intrusion prevention and detection. It's looking at the situational awareness picture that we get across the U.S. government and being able to mine that data and understand from a trend perspective what is anomalous, what's not anomalous, working on better data uh, mining, better analytics. These are the kinds of things that I want us to import from the private sector. What are better ways of using that data now that we have it? And also on that platform as we start to build on that, what are faster ways? What are faster ways of storage? These are all things that this audience and others are very good at and we're looking to build upon that. So we have our standard fence. Every car, even the fanciest ones, have a drivetrain. But we're also using that as our awareness of what's coming in and out of our federal agencies. The other kind of neat thing that we do that no one else can do is we protect those agencies with classified information. So the infrastructure supports using that kind of information without compromising it, but still protecting against it, which leaves our agencies a lot less vulnerable to things that we normally could not have put in place in that kind of an environment. On the private sector side, we have the same program. It's got a different acronym, Enhanced Cybersecurity Services. And uh, someday I'll create a whole other day job of looking at how to rename these things so things make sense. Go with me on this. ECS is the private sector version of Einstein. So same thing. It protects the private sector with classified information. We do not look at the traffic that comes back from the private sector. So in the name of privacy and civil liberties and all things right, we do for the government, we don't on the private sector. But when we make our analysis and understand what's anomalous and what's not and create indicators from that, we do push that out to the private sector. So we're not watching or collecting, we're simply protecting with classified for the private companies and we're giving them everything we learn off the government system, which we think protects them better, they're getting more indicators. Um, and that again is a fence on the outside of the network. Going forward, it's going to connect to monitoring the inside of the network in the government. So how many folks have heard of our other acronym, CDM, Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation? I don't make these things up. Uh, it used to be called Continuous Monitoring after Snowden. I was told one never says the word monitoring again in the U.S. government. <laughs> so now we are Continuous uh, Diagnostics and Mitigation. Again, that is true. Heard that. Uh, what this does is it brings out the best of the private sector tools, puts them into agencies. We're just rolling this out now. The agencies are, were able to buy them off a contract where it's a lot less expensive than if they bought them a la carte separately. The tools interlock, work together, and they constantly measure the security in different areas, for example, patching of the different networks. We also provide what we call a dashboard in each agency that they can start to see, again, instead of making a binder at the end of every year and exhausting the team, and the binder shows probably not the security but the compliance at that one time in history, it really means nothing. We are helping them to monitor their network 24 seven. 
and helping them to get a good glimpse of what's good. Just like your car, you have a battery light, you have a tire light. My car woke up the other day and told me uh, correct tire pressure. And I thought, is it complimenting me? Is that an adjective or a verb? We are hoping, yeah, it turns out it wasn't so correct. Um, we're hoping that this dashboard will help the agencies understand what's going on in their network, and then we as DHS for the government agencies collect all the dashboards and create what I call back home the mother dashboard that will reside in our National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, our 24-7 watch center. It has the big screens, it has 24-7 people, it has the phones ringing, it has the instant response, it has our US CERT, our Computer Emergency Readiness Team, it has our Industrial Control Systems CERT. So all of your top minds and cyber ninjas, except Darren who's out here, uh, but all of our best are focused on that 1,600 person organization that looks at how do we do incident response monitoring, how do we help an agency if their dashboard shows everything's fine but everybody else's dashboard shows something different, how do we push that information out to them. So again, the machines porting back to the agencies, combining the events they see inside the network with events that Einstein may see outside the network, reporting it back to our watch center, we put all that back together and <coughs> distribute it out. So how do we distribute it out? We do that also with people and machines. How many of you get our bulletins, those lovely PDFs that you probably get nine of with many different logos? So we're working on that so you don't get so much repetition, but it's difficult, so we're gonna streamline it as we can. I would rather, and tell me if I'm wrong, that you get something two or three times and not get it at all, but we are working on that. The other side is looking at how machines can send that out to machines. So developing a protocol. I could call it cyber wire, I could call it threat protocol. Uh, it's based on those protocols you've heard, sticks and taxi. So sticks being a language where we assemble a set of uh, facts that make up a threat indicator. Again, working with our privacy and civil liberties experts. So for example, an IP address or a hash of a file, uh, but not private info. And then taxi, I, yes, there was a pun intended, I didn't make it, being the transport protocol that delivers the sticks file. I recently joked with some people that these, these terms and these protocols are branded. This is how machines are going to talk to machines about security in the future, or one of many ways. You know, I'll also add that when you say to somebody, I'll send you an email, you don't say I'm going to SMTP or TCP IP. So for me, I'm thinking about simplifying sticks and taxi and going with something like CyberWire. Uh, but just, this is machine to machine cyber threat indicator speak. And it will go, it's, go, it's at international standards body. It's one of many ways you can do this. But we want to be able to push out this warning to again, use everything we see across our ecosystem based on all kinds of information to push that out to everyone as quickly as possible. Now we know that many, in many cases, for example, the financial sector's been very helpful with this. They created application interface that will speak six and taxi. Other groups have other APIs. But to me, it doesn't matter which API you use. I want you to get the indicators. And we will make sure that we work with all those bodies to make sure you get the indicators. The administration has created yet another acronym, but it's a good one. An ISAL, an Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. Anybody heard of this one? So the memo I got from the ISAL, the ISAL lets you take beyond the standard 16 sectors, so gas and oil, water, food, etc. Uh, groups of lawyers, groups of dentists, groups of anything that want to create, even this group, a trusted sharing of information of cyber threat protocol forum. You could proclaim a group an ISAL, and going forward we're pushing to get that group some targeted liability protection for sharing cyber threat indicators. The memo I got on this thing, and I share this often because it's, I found it funny, I was a little bit new to government at the time, and the memo I got was just for me, and it said how to pronounce ISAL, because people had been, heaven forbid, calling it an ISAO. And it said I dash S O W, and then it said like the female pig. And I sent it straight up to the deputy secretary because I thought it was funny. But we are really looking at those organizations to bring people together to decide how they want to share these indicators and get them out. Because it's not just about big companies, it's about universities, and 99% of our business power is small to medium companies. And those companies, in many cases, especially the smaller ones, and even the ones that operate your water, clean your water, small electric utilities don't have a full cyber staff. Some of their systems that operate these physical infrastructures are wide open to the open internet. We want them to have every bit of strength in cyber uh, threat indicators that the big companies have. And I'll tell you, equally as important, we are not seeing, if they're not running some kind of protection, we, you, us, private, government, anything, we are not seeing all the things that are trying to happen to them right now. 
The bad guys are probably all over that and we're not seeing it if we're not there. We want to make sure that we're connecting up to that small and medium business sector set as well. So as we build all this and tie our programs together, again, I go back to a root of trust, building partnerships. We have a, a group that enables CTOs and technical folks like yourselves from various companies to come in and share information with each other, with themselves, with us, transcends competitive boundaries. We are not asking, we don't expect, we don't want anyone to bring in sensitive intellectual property. What it's about is, I saw that vulnerability, I saw that vulnerability, what are the things that we as a sector, as an industry can do about this together to fix it? What's the science behind it? That's all voluntary. It does have a five pound document behind it, we're working on that, but really it's about how do you get more of the great minds together to work on that. We have other partnerships that come from uh, the cybersecurity framework that was developed by NIST and um, the Department of Homeland Security about three years ago that looks at, goodness, what are just the best practices? We want to take this discussion to the boardroom. I want to take your work to the boardroom. CEOs in this country need to know that the cyber budget, even in the smallest companies, is not what's left over when you bought a cool TV screen. And we have to make sure that securing the systems is front and center, just like securing your car, securing your office, securing your file cabinet, uh, and making sure that this is built together as part of an overall culture. All of the work that you're doing is going to enable great stuff on the internet forward, and we want to make sure that whether you're on the security side or the regular internet side, that we are building a culture where all this is enjoyed forward. So my top three priorities, number one, starting with trust, I keep repeating that, I mean it. Uh, number two is situational awareness. Using everything we see for protecting the government and pushing it out to private sector and enabling private sector to share or not share at their own will, but getting an indicator to all of those processors and memories out there that without that would execute. Because when you look at our adversaries, and are there any lawyers in here? I'm going to upset somebody. So our adversaries have no way of life they have to protect. They have no privacy and civil liberties worries. They have no lawyers. They have plenty of money. And they have solid relationships probably formed in the prisons. They execute with an alacrity they have yet to enjoy. And the number one thing that we can do that they can never do is use the speed of machines to put this data together to start blocking some of it. We'll never get all of it. We'll never prevent it. If you have a computer, I promise you, you're probably owned. Uh, if you're not already, you will be at some point. But the deal is, how are you resilient? How are you going to bounce back from it? 15 years ago with the I Love You virus and Melissa and some of these others and Code Red, if anybody remembers those, I think I am that old. Uh, the going wisdom, believe it or not, was oh, pull the plug. Pull it right out of the wall. Today, when we respond to cyber events, which by the way, internally we call clean up on aisle nine, no, not a joke. When we go in, we go as a whole of government procedure. So there's our side, the US CERT and the Cyber Ninja Responders, and the team we call the flyaway teams. And seriously, these guys get out sometimes on Saturday night when something happens. These are our most respected, most passionate. Uh, they will do anything for anyone. And sometimes they spend weeks on site, as you can imagine after what happened this summer. So when we send these guys out, they don't pull the plug. They go out again with the, the victim's consent and with a decent amount of paper, but believe it or not, we've expedited this. They go out with law enforcement side by side. We are not law enforcement, but we have law enforcement. Across the department, you know, we are not just infrastructure protection and national protection programs director. We're FEMA. We're U.S. Coast Guard. We're policy. We're intelligence and analysis. We are management. We're Homeland Security Investigations. My great colleague, Jeff Brannigan, one of the top cyber agents in Homeland Security Investigations. Um, detailed to me to help us understand how we work more smoothly with law enforcement, one of the strongest uh, uh, groups out there. U.S. Secret Service, we work closely with your agency and the FBI, but how do you make sense of that when something's happening, you want to respond to an incident? We pick up a team, they go, they do the paperwork, they can bring law enforcement with them side by side, they do not pull the plug. Why not? Because, number one, you tell the bad guy, I found you, and they go and they run away and we find less. And number two, we want to watch them for a while and see what they're doing. But the trick to that is to be skillful enough to know who in the private sector we work with, whether it's tools, who in the interagency we work with, so that we can watch the bad guy work without taking the victim out of business or taking them down. So keep enough of the network on while you can look at how it's happening, and if enabled, allow law enforcement to go get the bad guy and do the attribution. So we are trying to tune this to a finely honed skill, and unfortunately we have a ton of practice in it lately but it's a whole new world in how we do incident response. And all of that's based on trust. If people didn't trust us, they wouldn't call us. 
that they don't call us the bad guy wins. Uh, but having spent a lot of time in private sector, it's very important to me to not just be, quote, government, but to bring in everything the private sector does to get to know and to work with and be part of the teams that are developing the future of tomorrow. I know you have a talk coming up here um, on advertising. You know, I'll just say it should be scary. Probably isn't to you because you understand it, but it should be scary to most people that when they pull up an ad, it's pretty much targeted to something that's very similar to something they bought last week. Right? It should be scary that, that those instructions are executing on your computer. And we as an organization, as an industry, as a community, have to start protecting so that we can still get the great benefits of advertising and even targeted advertising. But also, if you want these companies to be able to show you a pair of shoes you might also like, you want to make sure it's not running malware on your laptop. So all these things require us to work together. And I know it's been said far too much, sharing information, working with the private sector, but we are truly uh, not talking about it, we're just doing it. We're coming out here, we are bringing companies in-house, we are working with the hacker community. People joke with me that this would be for me a career limiting event, and I did it anyway. I brought our deputy secretary to a DEF CON of Black Hat, two great hacker conferences, um, and he loved it. We want to understand what the best and the brightest are doing, we want to be there for customer service. We want to make sure that you know a little bit more each day of what your Department of Homeland Security is doing in cybersecurity. None of this is possible without working together. We can't do our job without our brothers and sisters in Homeland Security Investigations and the U.S. Secret Service uh, and the FBI and the intelligence community, but we line it up right to protect your privacy and civil liberties, to always be there to respond, and to get the best of science. The adversary was trying to eat our lunch because the computation power got better and run nice little malware. Uh, transport speed got a lot better. Storage is cheap. Uh, cloud is amazing. How do we protect that going forward? How do we protect the latest and greatest devices, the medical devices, the cars, everything you see in the news and stuff you don't see in the news? Uh, we depend on the minds in this room and the minds we represent. And I would invite you and I will help you figure out a way to get that information into your government so that we can get this right. As we start to build our own situational awareness, I'm very cognizant that many companies put data together also. We have many, many feeds of data. We combine that with the data that we see across the government. We buy some data. We in no way want to cannibalize business. If we don't help you make money, then you're not going to be able to innovate anymore. So we want to make sure that we are shaping the markets for better cybersecurity, that we're bringing this stuff to the boardroom. Uh, but first and foremost, that we are an organization, both with the National Protection of Programs Directorate as well as across the department. Uh, that you're proud of as taxpayers, and that we truly are customer servants. And we want to make sure uh, that all the work you're doing enables us to be better uh, and to please bring science back uh, to government. So I thank you, and I'd love to take some questions. speak with us today and um, thanks for all your hard work in moving the state of security forward in I guess industry and government. I wonder if um, or what are your thoughts on the place of DHS in helping promote security and the social aspect of things too. Um, we've spoken a lot about uh, kind of moving the state of information sharing and that kind of thing forward but I think a lot of the most kind of um, insidious attacks are those you know phishing campaigns, social uh, engineering, that kind of thing. How can we kind of help promote education in that aspect as well? Oh, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. A great question for me to make a shameless plug. Uh, October starts Cybersecur National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I think everyone wants to be Cyber Month, but one of the things that we do is promote outreach all the way to the elementary schools, <laughs> to normal citizens. We work with the National Cybersecurity Alliance, which is a group of companies and representatives that fund that organization to help fund us to get out there and get that message out. The tagline for many years is Stop, Think, Connect. It's old, but it makes sense. We have a lot of people, especially phishing, you get a note. In the old days, it was just, hi, I'm your bank. Please re-enter all your information, and I'll send it off to a cafe in Saturn. But now we want people to think before they click the link. 
And now the uh, events are very targeted. They come to us in the USG, they're very accurate, they've researched. Um, I think social media is amazing. It's one of the greatest things we have in our generation. It's brought, I was joking with someone yesterday, it's brought people back together from their high school reunions. It's made marriages that wouldn't have happened. Uh, we have to also protect it because it's enabling people that maybe shouldn't connect to others to do it. So how do we help protect those infrastructures so they can get built and help us work more? We're working very closely with um, many of uh, both our stakeholders and all the way to the kids, uh, as well as companies and education campaigns. We do education campaigns inside government. You know, practice. You get a weird note, did you click on it? You know, and we, we, we have a little bit of fun with it. We do name and shame it sometimes internally. And we encourage other companies to do these exercises the same way. And there's a long list, of, we can, I'm happy to connect to you after, a long list of resources we have, both in the US CERT as well as on the US campaigns for you and your families. Hi. Hello, Dr. Schneck. Welcome again to AFSA. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, refers back to RSA early, earlier this year, the conference RSA, and Secretary Jay Johnson spoke about encryption. So my question to you is, what is the latest DHS posture and thinking about encryption? Yeah, that's a great question. I never get out of the conference about it. Um, this one's really, really hard, right? This is the balance between, and we are working to find that balance. That's where we are. We have a huge stake in privacy and civil liberties and everything it takes to get there. And we also have a huge stake in law enforcement and protecting kids from getting kidnapped and, and crime. So how do we work this so that we get it right on both sides? And that is an open dialogue, and I, I believe the Secretary mentioned that they're having that, that continued dialogue. That is a very, Hard question, and it's not just for us to answer. There are global ramifications in that one too. But we do have two very distinct, and I'll make that really, really clear. We have two very distinct stakes in our department. We have a law enforcement part, and we have a non-law enforcement part, and we have to be true to both. Where are you? Right on, all right, now I'm the speaker. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, my question was, as things become more interconnected and the smart grid initiative and more systems are being connected to the internet, um, do you guys have any way or uh, ability to kind of force the hand of energy companies, water treatment facilities, stuff like that, to better protect their systems and not directly connect, connect them to the internet, you know, use best practice, I know it can be a, probably a tough job. You know, a lot of vulnerable systems, SCADA systems, HMIs, the top layer on HMIs, um, PLCs are just being directly connected to the internet. And it seems like a, a big issue, and I was wondering what you thought about that. It's a great question. I should, I should keep the mic. Um, yeah, I will come work with us. I'm going to make a recruiting pitch soon. Yeah. Um, So yes, <laughs> when you look at our map in the Watch Center, we run open source tools, which means two things. One is really good and one is hard. The good part is you got 50,000 crowdsourced developers, so they are really, really good. Uh, the other side is the bad guy has access to them also, which is true of any software. And you run those tools and you know that you can see a lot, I won't use the numbers, but they're too big. A lot of these systems, these digital systems that are not IP based, but they are digital controls, flashes of light, yes and no, binary, that makes stuff happen. They make a circuit open and close. They make water pour into our valve, which leads to other actions which can lead to an explosion. They create actions in the physical infrastructure. These industrial control systems, as they're called, or SCADA for the monitoring, super, uh, supervisory control data acquisition, they're connected to the way wide open internet, and I'll give you one more. A lot of these guys are using the password they came with in the box. Um, so we try very hard to reach out to them, um, we counsel them. We actually have a track. We have people that reach out with phone calls. Um, some of them track back to addresses that we don't know who they are, so we would if we could, but we can't. Uh, we can't force them at this point. There are certain regulations that exist in the energy sector, I know specifically, um, for cyber, but for stuff like that right now, that's not something we can quote force. But certainly uh, that sector has really uh, been very proactive in working with us to 
to look at what are the best practices that we can push down because the large energy companies don't want the small energy companies to have those vulnerabilities either, right? Because that hurts them. We are all connected in the grid. So they're working very closely with us, with them, with the CERT, Industrial Control System CERT, to find ways to not only reach out, but we did huge campaigns. For example, on black energy, we said, if you are a owner or operator of a piece of critical infrastructure, good morning, you're owned. Um, and we said, this is malware that is sitting here, ready to go when it wants to. Um, please, let's work together on how we're more resilient. We understand it's going to be there. It's going to be everywhere. What's going to happen when it lights up? How do I look for it? How do I put some friction in the enemy system by simply finding it, deleting it, and sort of thwarting their effort? So we are doing everything we can from an outreach perspective, a voluntary perspective, a culture-changing perspective, but we don't have a forcing mechanism on that. Yeah, a friend of mine used to say, he's a pilot, used to say, Phil, I can't teach cool. Um, we are trying our best to teach, but that one's not possible right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Dr. Schneck, thanks for uh, making the trip out. Uh, we appreciate seeing you at OWASP coming out to Black Hat at DEF CON. Um, the S4 campaign, if you see something, say something. It works well at the airport, public transit, it doesn't play so well on the internet. This notion of contacting vendors, letting them know about vulnerabilities. I, I believe that you share our belief system where talking about vulnerabilities needs to be a safer conversation. It's not about marketing, it's about making the world a safer place. What are you doing at DHS to help improve that conversation for us? Uh, so that's a, a great question too. We are, I do embrace see something, say something. We don't own that by the way, that belongs to New York City. We stole it. I learned that they might be due last week. Um, I believe on the internet, with the information sharing, we can be see something, say something. If you take a lesson from the aviation industry, where nothing bad, should, don't waste a good disaster, learn from it, never let that happen again. Every event, and you translate it to cyber, it's when an instruction or malware tries to do something to a machine, record it, and then push that event out to everybody else so it doesn't happen to them. So that's an oversimplification of what things like reputation systems can do in real time when you start looking at how you look at the risk of dealing with a certain entity on the internet, the machines can do this in real time. It's when we do that real-time sharing, the president came to our op center and said, this is where it was on January 13th, and just a day and a half after they towed the van that all his communication staff used, um, he stood there and he still said, this should be the center for all of your cyber threat indicators. And our job now is to collect those cyber threat indicators and push them out to everybody so that when we see something, we say something to everybody else that we can reach. And the hardest part of that is not been building it. I've shared with many that it's a server that pushes out data, right? Any of you could have built that with a Mountain Dew and a bag of Doritos in a couple of hours. The issue is the policy. How much, if somebody sends us an indicator, how much do we ask the machines to scrub? And is it our authority to scrub? Are we getting enough of it? Are we observing the privacy and civil liberties work? Um, does it go to law enforcement? So where we are now is that server got to see something, say something. It sees something. How do we say something? So we were at the point where we were working with the Hill and with other agencies on exactly what gets scrubbed by machine, which is most. What has to get scrubbed by humans, which is anything that could be you know, free-form text or where somebody could inject private information. And then how do we get it out as quickly as possible to everyone that would receive it? Forgive me for clarifying. Uh, so cyber threat indicators, the, the information sharing thing we believe in, to some degree, and there's considerations for that from a privacy standpoint, which you're aware of. Uh, what I'm asking more about is the solution of vulnerabilities. This is a community of people that identify vulnerabilities in web applications and software. Uh, contacting vendors is a very challenging thing. We work really hard at trying to improve that conversation. So perhaps from the disclosure standpoint, how are you helping us? So we have some, and I'm happy to talk more after, we have some partnerships in place where vendors can get together and learn about this. If you report it to us, we can work with how to anonymize it under uh, several different programs. There's one called Everything's an Aggregate, or PCII, Protected Critical Infrastructure Information. You can label it that and we won't release it at all, but you can tell us about it and we can help people protect against us. Um, and there are also mechanisms. So we want, and I want to make this, uh, we're working very hard on how do you do coordinated release, is what they call it. So if there's a vulnerability that you know about, how do we make it so that everyone's prepared for it before the bad guy gets it? Because once it's out, it's out to everybody. So we're working very hard on that as well. And I'm happy to chat with you afterward on some of speaking with some companies out here as well on what that looks like. Yeah. Is that answer more there? OK, so come find me out. Yeah. Wait, over here. Do you guys need my mic? 
And we need that because the adversary dances in the streets when we use uh, the prior events as an excuse not to share any information now. But we do have to get it right, and we owe you that. And there are a lot of people working very, very hard to make that happen the absolute right way. And that's why we're out here building up that trust. Because we don't want to lose to people that hurt us and do crime because there were other incidents before that burned that trust. We're trying to get it right. And I'll tell you, when you share information with the Department of Homeland Security, you know you share information with the Department of Homeland Security. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask a, a question that builds upon something that another uh, audience member had asked. Um, I admire what the DHS has been doing for like the past 10 years in engaging the private sector. And I think that might work because the private sector and DHS have goals that are somewhat aligned. But one thing that we're all pretty much sure here is that private sector incentives and goals are not always aligned with consumers and with, with me, with my family, the energy that I run my home, and so forth. So what is DHS doing to protect individuals? And how can you do that without legislating um, ways that, that prevent you know, power companies for running SCADA systems? like you mentioned. So I just want to clarify, don't go away. So I want to, you want to ask, what are we doing to protect families that use the power from these companies that are perhaps not doing it for the best? That's right. Way? Right now you're having a conversation with the energy companies and various okay. companies that run control systems, and yet those control systems impact everyone's lives. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing essentially for the public to make sure that those companies, I mean, if you, if all we're doing is talking to them and strongly suggesting that, hey, you don't run your SCADA systems in an insecure fashion, and then my power goes out, and then my life is impacted by that, yeah. how is that okay, and why isn't there legislation in place and ways to make sure that, if, even if that did happen, that there would be consequences, and consequences that had penalties which were sufficiently strong would stop a power company from ever doing that again. And I don't mean like, oh, $100,000 a day penalties. Like, oh, what were your profits? Oh, OK, I think we'll just take a 10% chunk out of that and you know, see you later. No, I hear you. We are looking, you said the, the big word, consequences. We measure cybersecurity as how are we mitigating those consequences. That's why we're reorganizing to, from being separate cyber and infrastructure protection organizations within our directory to doing it together. The legislation is the responsibility of the Hill. We are very clear with uh, all of our, and I'll say, the Hill's been wonderful to work with in that if you think about the different areas of expertise that every member of Congress and every senator has to understand enough to write some of this legislation, they've been very, very good to us on cyber, taken a lot of time. This is one of the areas that we work with. Uh, but we're really trying to work with the private sector and just mitigate the consequences. It's not so much our job, or it hasn't been given to me as a job, to push for or against uh, regulation. It's simply, how do we go forward and make sure that this large connected infrastructure has within it the means to deflect events, to detect events, to tell everybody else about events? How is it uh, self-protecting and resilient? Because typically that's going to be stronger than legislation that takes a very long time to pass and is based on technology of five years ago. But having said that, we are working directly with, with all of our legislators and all of our interagency partners on what's the right way to get things done? Is it legislation? Is it this way? And these are some of the conversations that have to keep happening. Sorry, I don't have an exact answer on where the hill's going. I never know. And we have time for one last question over here. Hi, um, I'm, uh, my name is Patrick, I work at Netflix, and I'm a uh, maintainer of one of the tools that helps secure cloud infrastructure, and I've never seen a pull request from DHS. I've never seen Uncle Sam in our uh, chat room, uh, I've never had a, a, um, uh, an issue filed by the NSA, and I think uh, you were talking about moving out to uh, the West Coast, and maybe trying to work more with these companies, and I think it would uh, really help that relationship if you were uh, working with us on some of these things on open source software. And I understand that can be difficult, uh, as you said earlier, that you have lawyers on your meetings and that can make it difficult for an open source software. But I guess that's kind of a statement. I kind of wanted to, to see what your, your thoughts were on that. I'd love to do that. And the lawyers are helping us have those meetings, because before that, we couldn't have the meetings. 
now we see tons of new technologies, uh, some of which we're, we're going to be able to invest in. So absolutely, and when I say we're moving after, we're not here yet, we're looking at office space. Um, so it's not like we're here, we've ignored anybody, we're just getting this picked up, but uh, come see Jeff and me afterward, and we'll make sure that we talk to you. If I had my way, I'd get to talk to everybody in this room a lot longer. So thank you. So one more thing I want to add. Um, we have 2,000 most amazing people on the planet, as I said, in cybersecurity. Uh, this department has an urgent and impactful mission. We can't pay you the way your current employers do, but if you or any of your friends really want to come be part of that mission at any time, we need to grow that team. And we want the best and the absolute brightest. And I would look to this crowd to help deliver some of those, and we will do everything we can to shrink the hiring time down to something, something just above reasonable, and bring people in. It is a fascinating environment, and I don't want to lose good minds to crazy process. Uh, and it would mean the world to us in government to have more of you inside and help us understand how to take this thing forward. And I also want to give a special shout out to our NCATS team. These guys scan all the networks, you know? <laughs> All the networks of our federal agencies look at the really bad stuff. Um, and by our Secretary's Finding Operational Directive, for which we got the uh, authority score in, from the Hill in 2014, we were able to reduce uh, vulnerabilities by a significant percentage because of that, because of their work a few weeks ago. So thank you very, very much for having us, and uh, I truly appreciate all the work you do.